A very good evening to all of you have, who have joined with us today. I'm excited to welcome you to the third episode of the webinar series held in English for the year 2022, organized by the Seminars Committee of the BSL 2022-2023 on the topic of law relating to presidential part. This webinar series is conducted on the Zoom platform for those who have been unable to register on Zoom could also join by watching the live stream on the BSL YouTube channel. We would like to thank the seminar committee of the BSL headed by Mr. Isuru Balapatabandi, secretary to BSL. And also I would like to take this opportunity to thank the president of BSL, Mr. Salia Piri's president, pres, president council for all the support and guidance given to us in organizing this webinar series. Today's topic is the law relating to presidential pardon. And joining us today, we have the distinguished panel of experts ready to enlighten us, share their knowledge and experience. We will have three panelists and the moderator for the day. So each panelist will have even more time to share their knowledge and experience with us on the topic. I now take this opportunity to introduce the esteemed panel and the moderator for the day. Firstly, I would like to introduce Mr. Prasanthalal Dialvis, President Council. Mr. Dialvis is a product of Ananda College, Colombo. Mr. Prasanthalal Dialvis obtained his LLB and LLM from the University of Colombo. It is 35 years since he was admitted and enrolled as an attorney at law. He was a state council of the Attorney General's Department for seven years. He then joined the unofficial bar in the year 1991. And today he practices in the trial and appellate courts of Sri Lanka. Mr. Diawis was appointed a President's Council in year 2012. Mr. Diawis was a director at Sampath Bank PLC for nine years and deputy chairman of Sirpata Finance PLC, a, mem a member of the Sampath Group, uh, had to retire, uh, sorry, uh, Sampath Group 2011 to 2020, had to retire due to the corporate governance rules. He joined the board of Softlogic Holdings PLC as a director in 2011. He is also a director at SC Securities Private Limited, Asset Line Re Leasing Private Limited, Horus Sands Hotels Limited, and Alithia International School. Mr. Dialvis is a visiting lecturer and examiner at the Faculty of Law, University of Colombo, Kotalawala Defense University, and Apit Law School. He is a member of Incorporate Council of Legal Education in Sri Lanka, member of the Council of University of Moratua, member of the Press Council of Sri Lanka, member of the Faculty Board of Faculty of Law, University of Colombo, and member of Center for Study for Finance, uh, sorry, for Human Rights of the University of Colombo. He's a senior consultant to the NSBM Green University. He's also an associate member of the Chartered Institute of Marketing, SIM UK. Mr. Dialvis is presently the honorary legal advisor of the Chartered Institute of Marketing, Sri Lanka. He was a member of the Official Languages Commission of Sri Lanka in the year 2010 to 2011. He was a director of the Board of Management of the Lakshman Kadragama Institute of International Relations and Strategic Studies. He was a founder of, founder member of the Consumer Authority of Sri Lanka in year 2002. He was an advisor to the Honorable Minister of Export Development from 2008 to 2009. Mr. Dialvis was the National President of Junior Chamber Sri Lanka in the year 1997. He's a Senator of Junior Chamber International and also a certified national trainer. Now, secondly, I would like to introduce Mr. Nalinda Indathisa, President Council. Mr. Indathisa, President Council, has completed 32 years of the bar at the bar, and during which period he served the Attorney's General Department for five years. Also, he is a lecturer in law at the Police Higher Training Academy. Mr. Indathisa Peace, President Counsel, practices criminal law in original and appellate courts, specializes in white collar crime, intellectual property prosecutions, computer crime, money laundering, et cetera, and bribery and et cetera, and company law prosecutions. 
Thirdly, I would like to introduce Mr. Shanta Jayawardena, attorney at law. Mr. Shanta Jayawardena holds an LLB and LLM from the University of Colombo, Faculty of Law. He mainly practices the practices in the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court, and he's expertise in the in public law. Also, he's a visiting lecturer in constitutional law in the Open University of Sri Lanka. The moderator for the day is, the, is Mr. Pulasti Rupasinghe, attorney at law. Mr. Pulasti Rupasinghe is an independent practitioner speciali specializing in the areas of civil litigation, arbitration, public law, and corporate law. He's also presently functioning as a counsel at Neela Kandan and Neela Kandan attorney at law. Uh, and Mr. Pulasti was called to the bar in 2011 and was an associate at Julius and Creases Attorneys at Law, after which he was a junior counsel at the chambers of Mr. Faisal Mustafa, President's Council. Mr. Pulasti holds a Bachelor of Laws and Master of Laws degrees from the University of Colombo and has functioned as an advisor to the Ministry of Local Government and Minister of Sports. Members joining the session by Zoom may send their questions through Q&A chat box to, the, to reach the moderator. And I will now hand over the proceedings to the moderator. Over to you, Mr. Pulasti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Adisha. Uh, thank you, everyone uh, who are joining with us at the, the, for the latest uh, webinar of the BSL webinar series for the year 2022. Um, before we commence, I must thank the seminars committee of the BSL headed by the BSL secretary, Mr. Isuru Balapadabadi, for gathering a distinguished uh, panel of experts to talk about um, uh, uh, an issue that is uh, frequently cropping up in, uh, in the public discourse uh, these days, that is the law relating to the granting of uh, presidential pardons. Um, this is an um, area that uh, I think uh, has uh, received a lot of attention and uh, it has been a hot button issue in the public discourse, uh, especially view of, in view of several uh, pardons granted in the uh, recent uh, past to uh, some uh, persons who have been convicted uh, by trials at bar in the High Court and thereafter whose convictions have been affirmed by the, their lordships of the Supreme Court. Um, and in view of the, these, uh, for want of a better phrase, controversial pardons that have been granted, the, the, the issue has come up uh, often uh, for discussion among the general public and of course the legal community. So, um, and as uh, many of you who are gathered uh, would know, the, the, the president is vested with the constitutional power in terms of our constitution, in terms of Article 34 of the constitution, to grant pardons. And when it comes to granting of pardons uh, for persons who are condemned to death, uh, there is a particular procedure to follow, uh, subject to any comments or corrections by the esteemed panelists. Uh, I believe other than in the instance of a person who uh, is uh, condemned to death, the, uh, the constitution does not appear to stipulate any particular criteria that should be adhered to by the president regarding pardon. Uh, but uh, before I move on to the panelists, I must say that as a, as a brief introductory note, that uh, this is not an uncommon practice. Many countries uh, have a system of granting a pardon. If, if one were to go back to the history, uh, I believe this um, the the right to grant pardon to the head of state stems from the royal what is what was known as the royal prerogative of mercy. Uh, that was a royal prerogative that was uh, exercised by the 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 monarchs of England and in many countries that um, follow, especially the presidential system of government, like. Sri Lanka and, of course, uh, very famously, the United States has uh, a system whereby either the de facto or the de jure head of state is accorded this power of granting pardons to persons who are convicted of various offenses. So having said that, I will not take much of the time of uh, our 
distinguished panelists, I will first uh, turn to uh, Mr. Prashantalal Dialvis, uh, President's Council, sir. Uh, you are a senior uh, and a distinguished member of the bar specializing in criminal law. Also, you have been a lecturer to many of us. Uh, so I would like you to first explain to the uh, to the to the participants, uh, what what is the now? Uh, it is almost a given uh, that a person who is accorded a pardon would be uh, punished or would be sentenced to a particular punishment by a competent court of law. So, what what is the uh, the rationale and the legal principles and the basis behind imposing a sentence or a punishment on an individual? And uh, once a competent court of law has adjudicated upon this man's uh, liberty uh, and accorded him a punishment, what is then the legal as well as, um, if you can also briefly comment on the, the, the philosophical and the sociological rationale in then uh, giving that individual a second chance uh, in life and uh, then thereafter commuting or reducing or uh, integrating him back into the society uh, before the conclusion of whatever the punishment that has been imposed on that individual by a court of law. If you can uh, start this discussion on those uh, on that note, sir, I would be grateful. Thank you, Pulasti. Uh, you uh, you categorically very clearly said about a second chance, and that's exactly what Article Thirty Four is. Now let me just tell you. Uh, personal experience. Now, I have been a state council prosecuting and I have sent 22 people to gallows, right? So I have prosecuted. And in, as a defense counsel, three accused went to gallows. So I have both that experience of this whole uh, scenario. But I think it's my duty, Pulasti, to explain to you. I mean, just most of the cases are death sentence cases that are given pardon. It's not a very simple process. Now, in our times, I mean, I was prosecuting from 1983 to 1990, seven years. It was all jury trials. All murder cases, rape cases, attempted murder cases were jury trials. Now, you can see the effort that goes into this process. Even now, huge process, a longer process, detailed process. Now, selecting a jury is a cumbersome, but a very systematic and a logical scenario where accused has a right to object for two jurors with, and uh, uh, without reason. Like that, so much of options given. Now, let me tell you the experience of, for the uh, ladies and gentlemen who have not experienced passing out a death sentence. When jury comes and pass the death sentence, the judge basically pronounces it. He will switch off, this is very interesting, switch off the electric, electrical fans, light. So it's sometimes if it is night, it is darkness. It's with candlelight, right? Such a, such a process happens. And I was did first prosecute in the Badullah High Courts. There, Mr. Ellen Jaratna would even wear a black kind of a hood or a, or a hat in passing the death sentence. And uh, so when death sentence is past, basically, right? The whole atmosphere changes. Such, that is the kind of feeling, that is the kind of uh, the, the, the power, or that's the kind of uh, sanctity or, 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 or difficulty, I'll put it that way, that in goes with a death sentence. It's not a very simple process. And as you know, there is something called alacatus. My learned friends, uh, Ms. Nalinda Indatissa probably will explain more. There is a chance given to the accused. So let me explain. This is not a very simple process. I still remember, vividly remember, the first sentence I got in Badullah, death sentence. As a prosecutor who won the case, I could not hold it because the entire family crying out. Right? Entire family crying out. And I... I at that time, you had to take a call, you know, not like today, it was 1985. You had to take a trunk call. I have to talk to my father, mother. It was so difficult. And my boarding mates who were from levers and from tobacco, 
Jerome and Satri, they took me to a planter's home that evening to, for me to get out of this whole mental mess. It's not easy. What I'm trying to stress is death sentence is something passed uh, by a court of competent law. Then there is a court of appeal process. Then there is a Supreme Court judges. And me, most of the cases that is controversial today, there have been five judge bench of the Supreme Court. So I leave it to the rest to under, for you to understand, but my colleagues to explain the other aspects of it. So my dear friends, this is the process of a death sentence. Even otherwise, even otherwise, whole process moves on. When you plead not guilty for a case, the trial commence, trial starts. And with a laborious of written submissions or oral submission from both sides, honorable magistrate or a high court judge will pass a sentence. Very sacrosanct thing he does. So this is not a very simple process. And very importantly, it cost tax people our money. Lot of money. Lot of time is wasted. Not wasted. Used for this process. So with that background, as Pulati said, I am entrusted to get on to the philosophical aspect of this whole process. We learned jurisprudence in our studies. It was 84 years our subject. In that, there is something called positivist gurukula or school of thought. Now that is the most oldest gurukula that came with Austin and Justinian. They merely said, very simply and clearly, that is a prerogative. It's a, the exact word used is the command of the sovereignty. So it is this article 34 is all about that. It gives a prerogative, as Pulati said, second chance or a prerogative to give release. Now, positivist, Austin, Justinian, they said that is God's law. That is the command of the sovereignty, command of the state. And no one should interfere. They never bothered about morals. Now, that's the point I like to drive here. They never considered morals. That's the positive is. Yata dushti kavade in singular. But opposing this came Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas. They brought in natural law as an opposing gurukula. Pataniyaka, opposing Gurukula. And they said, morals are important. Not the order of the sovereign. Now, this is the point that I like to stress from it because this is jurisprudence you and I learn. The basis of science of judi uh, judicial process. So today the trend is natural law. We must consider morals. We must and we should consider morals in the process of the law. What is right? What is wrong? So this is crucial from jurisprudential point of view. The era of positivist law is not there. Now, this can be seen even today's context. In Afghanistan, positivist law, order of the government. Women can't educate. They have to cover their dress. They can't go for jobs. That's the command of the sovereignty. Morals has no place. Except for countries at this moment like Afghanistan or Myanmar at this moment. No other country has positivism as a, a concept of law. So my dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, my first point as from jurisprudential point of view, this pardon must be looked at from a moral point of view. It has to be morally right. I like to stress that morally right. Now, next, I will. I'm entrusted by Pulasti to uh, discuss about the uh, concepts of sentencing. Now, as you know, the philosophy behind is when I commit a murder or if I rape a girl, it is not raping that girl alone, it is against society. I do commit in criminal law. The basic concept is I do commit the offense against society. And that's why society take over. 
That's why the police and the legal arm take over. That's why Honorable Attorney General prosecutes, files an indictment because it is an offense against state. Now, that's the concept of criminal law. Now, in that kind of a context, there are five principles of sentencing. The first is deterrence. Second is in, uh, deterrence means there, I will explain one by one through that anger. The second one is incapacitation. Third one is rehabilitation. Fourth one is restoration. I missed one, retribution. That should be number two. So let me take you through one by one. Deterrence or in singular, nivartaniya. What does it mean? When you punish a person, is it deters that person from committing any more offenses of that nature. That's why we have a call system called IRC, you know, Island Reconvicted Criminal. That's why exactly when you commit an offense, fingerprints are taken and sent to the archives. And from there, if I plead again, my fingerprints are taken and the punishment is pronounced after two weeks because that's a system. It's called Island Reconvicted Criminal, IRC Kare again. So that's exactly, it's, it's, it's a system that to deter people from committing more offenses. Secondly, it deters society. I repeat again, it deters society. When there is a jail term, when there is a punishment, when there is a fine, it deters the society. That's why in rape, there is a minimum punishment. When there is a torture, there is a minimum punishment because torture is a juice cogens, it's an international offense. There is a minimum punishment imposed. So there are many other offenses like that. And as you know, murder, if you are convicted of murder, of course, it is the death sentence. If it is culpable homicide not amounted to murder, if it is knowledge, is maximum is 10, but if it is other grounds is 20 years. That's a maximum. So what I want to stress here is the whole basis of a punishment is to deter society not to commit such offense thereafter. So it has twofold. One against that individual to deter him. Second one is the other. And the second point, uh, the, myth, uh, the concept is incapacitation. That's because the person put in jail I like to stress, a person putting in jail is incapacitated to commit such more offenses in the future. He can't commit such offenses in the future. So that those two concepts goes hand in hand, overlaps one on the other. So now let me explain the whole presidential pardon. Yes, presidential pardon, as Pulasti said, giving a second chance. It gave a royal prerogative. Now. Let me, I am uh, uh, sure my colleague Shanta will dwell, he's a constitutional expert on much more on rule of law. But keeping the word rule of law, that is very, very vital here. I'm just using the word, leaving Shanta to explain much more being a constitutional expert. Now, it has to be according to the rule of law. Now, I like you to... Uh, Take you uh, to this moment, you talk of rule of law. My mind always go to our lady of justice, Athena. She is covering her ears, sorry, her eyes. That means no feelings. She has a sword in her hand, kaduak. So she is brave, editorai. And importantly, she has a scale in the other, other hand. This symbolizes our system. This symbolizes the rule of law. Now, let me take a few examples in the recent past. Just examples. Whether that sense was there in that. When Duvinda Silva was given presidential pardon, yes, the president can give it. I leave it rest to my colleague, Mr. Indatissa, to explain the processes. But then I, I want to speak about rule of law, the concept, and deterrence. 
what is the message when the same president appoints him to the as a chairman of one of the one of the most companies best companies now that is really attacks the rule of law when galbodate nyanasara thero is given presidential pardon for contempt of court which he was sentenced for 6 years r i in may 2019 it becomes political he including the earlier one earlier one is a former mem- member of the parliament who was uh, who was in uh, with the present president as a defense advisor mind you member of the parliament who was looking after the defense during when he was secretary minister of defense now let's look at galbodo atte nyanasarathe of the bodubal sena now if you look at that he is given a presidency par par what is the rationale no one knows but in the same way when mr ranjan ramanayak is a member of parliament of course i don't condone any one of them because all of us belongs to the system of justice no one should say uh, even your tough word even if it is true facts are true facts are stubborn we have to protect our system of justice so i cannot condone what he said but then these are what people common people asking me nyanasara amuduru anta dunna nan ranjan ta denna bari e manushya bohoma atta katha karabu minihekne we are is deterrence to society to contempt of court when there is no equality and there is no basis why nanasara hamdro could be given and not given to ranjan ramana what is the basis what's the difference there is i'm sure my learned friend uh, shanta will explain equality and all that there is a problem here i'm talking uh, nalinda you would agree with me we face criminal Uh, we are we are we are we are defend we are defending people. They ask us, "Aye sir, apita bari? Aye mage puta ar bari?" I mean, there were a flood of people who got convicted who came to me. Apita ganna bari the samava sir mage puta ar. Now this similar thing is found. I just want to take a scenario. Just leave out uh, Pulasti with your permission. Like bail. When politicians they go to hospital, <laughs> our poor clients end up in. riman you know riman in sri lanka is the worst thing that can happen to a man worst thing sardin gahana wagala kiyanne they pack like sardin like this they have to sleep there some people sleep in the toilet that's a riman said and the politicians end up in the hospital so when they ask me a uh, such question i'm sure now in the in the this also must be facing say sir apita bari the sir spiritalia where is the answer where is rule of law where is deterrence power money has everything right so similar way i'm talking of deterrence which is a very important factor of punishment in the highest court of supreme court with five judges including sometime chief justices adjudicate and hear and disregard of that the president gives pardon and put him into the as a chairman of a government entity <laughs> that cannot be accepted that doesn't send the message of deterrence and especially in the present context of royal park case to jama when today the former head of state says there were money involved money koti phansi yak mind you and when ratan thero goes to the cid and complains against the head of state for lying what happens to the people of this country what are they asking us do they have the faith in our system there is no deterrence my dear friends there is no deterrence to society that is why i personally oppose this i personally oppose this for this there must be a rational there must be a rational there must be certain criterias and each one 
I propose the bar association. Every person who is now, I mean, every poet, Vesak, every Independence Day, every Christmas Day, people are released. And I personally am happy when they, I see them walking out. I'm personally very happy. As a Buddhist and as a citizen, as a human, I'm happy. They are given, as Pulati's word, second chance. Fine. But let there be reasons on a web why each person was released. So when people know good behavior, oh, I know certain accused who started meditation, who started training uh, other prisoners in meditation. Oh, I personally know uh, recently uh, the uh, court of appeal affirmed the doctor who killed a garment girl. Now I appeared for the agree party in the Nigambu High Courts for the girl. I mean, I appeared for the trade union. Uh, pre trade zone uh, trade union on behalf of her rights. Now, but I am made to understand he's teaching uh, the prisoners English. Now, I'm not asking him to be released immediately. Just now, the Court of Appeal affirmed the High Court judge's order. But at least someday, if he has become good, oh, I'll come to that later, right? It has to be considered. But those re re reasons must be made public. Otherwise, deterrence concept get affected, seriously affected. So that is one. The other one, my dear friends, is very clearly retribution, eye to eye, which is Hammurabi code, tooth to tooth. So death sentence, death. Yeah, that's what concept, but that's old fashioned. People don't still believe in it, eye to eye. And that's what exactly is. But moment in a very short time, like because of Milroy Fernando's wife, Monica Fernando was released in 2005. Only this. J.R. Javadana Vital, he reached heritage of legal background. He's a lawyer. His whole family are lawyers. Release Gona Velasuni, I'm from Gamba, who was convicted for rape and later used for his all political hardcore violent activities and he succumbed to finally being shot and dead. This creates a very bad precedence from a retribution point of view. Let me now get to the important one, rehabilitation. Now this is very important because I, as a Buddhist and as a citizen, and with all the religions, I'll explain later about other religions. Believe in rehabilitation. The Angulimala, who was Ahinsaka, and the teacher was told that, you know, Ahinsaka is uh, having an affair with uh, the teacher's wife, asked to bring uh, 999 uh, odd fingers. So he kept on in a killing spree. Imagine now. And Buddha intervenes and stops him. And he's made an arahat. And the most important thing is when my children were born, there was Angulita, Angulimala Pirita chanted. What does Angulimala Pirita say? Angulimala Pirita says, from the day, I repeat strongly here, from the day I became Buddha's disciple and followed this path, I have never killed anyone. With that strength, may the pain of the mother but that's where, you know, woman had a pain and, uh, and he was asked to go and recite by Buddha. And that is the Satya Kriya he makes. That rehabilitation from the day he became uh, Arihati has never can see the power of Satya Kriya. And that is exactly what is chanted even up to date called Angulimar, the Pirita, just before a childbirth. That, and, and Jesus, when People were stoning uh, a prostitute. He said, tell the stone, if you have not had done any sin, nobody bear that stone. Because we all do sin. We all can't say we are without sin. So that kind of concepts, rehabilitation is very, very important. We have gone through 71 insurrection, 81 insurrection in the South, 30 years. We, and we have, we have been very successful 
in rehabilitating the political fighters and bringing them to society. Today, the seventy. Mr. Mr. Dialvis, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, sir, because uh, I don't want uh, to cut in too much into the Q and A time. Finishing. So yes, thank you, thank you. Sir. I, I think I. Uh, how many minutes I have? Um, so you, if you can wrap up in two three minutes, I would be. Yeah, I, I'm intend to. I intend to. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. So in that kind of a context, right? Rehabilitation is very important. People must be rehabilitated and sent to society. And there is the other point is restorative justice. Now I propose uh, in uh, today's context, when a, uh, in a rape case, when a girl you know is being paid compensation in 1995 amendment. So what you can do is, if there is a release, let him or her compensate the victim. I mean, I'm just suggesting a process. So we fulfill that restoration. The last two po last point that I like to dwell is there is a human right issue concept. When a death sentence is passed, today they don't sign after June 1979. They are put in a death cell. To me, if I, it is me, I rather prefer to get myself executed and finish my agony rather than living my whole life in a death cell. But, but president, for whatever dharmishta reasons, don't sign after 1979 June. And they are in misery. It's a a death cell means no light. It's, it's a real misery. And I always believe if it is, you know, Capitipola went through uh, the process, he pointed his neck and said, cut it. Now, fine. As we know, there were some uh, prisoners who went on the roof and said, please execute us. So in a country where there is no death sentence, in, a, in the world where there are Amnesty International says 2,000 people, well, we must consider rehabilitation and a process, but with reasons. And the other reasons, when we are keeping these people, is the taxpayers' money is used to feed them for the rest of their life. So that's another factor, Pulasti, we must consider. So I propose finally, these are the uh, kind of uh, uh, jurisprudential background, and these are the sentencing background, and uh, these are human rights and uh, practical uh, taxpayer uh, issues that I wish to place before that. Thank you, Bulas. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank you for that uh, enlightening uh, start to our discussion. Uh, next, I turn to Mr. Indadis, sir. Uh, sir, are you there with us? Yes. Um, now, you, you are also a senior practitioner in the, uh, in the uh, senior criminal defense practitioner, and you have also being a member of the official bar. Um, so I think you have a perspective on this issue from both sides, if I may say so. Um, sir, uh, now, we all know that uh, Sri Lanka is a country which uh, where, in fact, an, a person accused of an offence has a constitutionally guaranteed right with regard to the presumption of innocence. So any um, matter involving convicting a person of a crime would be done after the protracted trial uh, founded upon the, the, the presumption of innocence. Now, <clears throat> as, a, as, a, as a criminal lawyer, uh, what are your views about Article 34 of the Constitution and its application, um, considering the fact that a, a, an individual is in fact imposed a punishment by a competent court of law in almost all instances, unless of course he pleads guilty himself to an offence after a, a, a duly conducted and concluded uh, trial, which uh, thereafter uh, a judgment may be affirmed uh, by a uh, appellate court. So, so in that context, wh what are your views about uh, the uh, exercise of powers under Article 34 from from the perspective of a criminal lawyer? Yeah, I Rulasti, thank you for the question. Now. Uh, I, I wish to take it uh, over from where Mr. Prasandala Aldi Alvis stopped. Uh, Mr. Alvis, in fact, went on on this question of how trials are being conducted in courthouses. Now, you get convictions in the magistrate's court, convictions in the high court. Those are the two appellate courts, uh, the two original courts 
administ administering uh, criminal justice. Of course, there are uh, court martials and uh, various other forums also. But by and large, it is the magistrate court and the high court. So, as Mr. Prasandala Aldialis also mentioned, uh, whether it is a trial in the magistrate court or trial in the high court, first and foremost, an investigation has to proceed. Lot of time, money and energy of the state, taxpayers' money, is used uh, for the investigation of an offence. Then once the investigation is done, now, when an investigation is going on also, there is a role for the investigator to, to, to play. He has to be very balanced. He has to uh, very fairly play his role. But I don't know whether in Sri Lankan context it happens that way. Uh, now, when a trial happens, uh, yes, during the time of jury trial, of course, you still have the option of electing a jury trial, but uh, by and large, most people, maybe due to financial reasons, do not uh, elect jury trials. But during the time where we had jury trials in common, it was a very tedious process. You get down government officers, they are paid butter, they are paid money. Then state council are there, they consider the indictment and then evidence is properly evaluated and presented before court then uh, accused as you said has the right presumption of innocence applies at that stage uh, then accused also is given certain, a lot of rights and then the defense counsel we do a lot of research work and do the cross-examination at the end of all the judgment is passed and a sentence is imposed now, I wish to speak on two kinds of sentence. One, one is the death sentence and the other is sentences that are imposed by court other than the death sentence. Now, if you, if you analyze the constitution, before analyzing the constitution, I will get, in, get, get on to the uh, same thing that I was discussing. Now, once a judgment is given and a person is convicted and sentenced, he has a right of appeal. Now, at the very beginning of the trial, the presumption of innocence applies. But when he is convicted, when he is convicted, he goes to the court of appeal. If it's a, a non-jury trial or a jury trial, with a, with a, as a convicted prisoner. So, the level degree to which the presumption of innocence applies at that stage will be different in regard to matters like bail, etc. The onus of proving that he is judgment is wrong then shifts to some degree to the appellant. He has to start the case. Then with all those principles involved, again, the court of appeal hears the case. But in the case of trial at bar, the, 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 the supreme appeal goes to the Supreme Court. There is a five bench who goes through the case. Now, after all these trial procedure, then appeal procedure, all that is exhausted, if the conviction still stands, the person is put to serve his sentence. Now, at that point, the principles of punishment, theories of punish sentencing, that my, Mr. Prasanta Laldi Ali, President Council spoke of, will apply. Because, will apply because sometimes in, in these famous cases, uh, after a conviction, a person being sentenced acts as a deterrent to the society. Then also, 
one has to be mindful of the fact that in a case there are there is not only not only the prosecution and the defense prosecution is looking after the social aspect they are performing the social duty then the defense is looking after the aspect of the accused but there is a third side that is the accrued party in recognition of the rights of the accrued party now the victims and witnesses protection of act also has been put in place so there is a victim who is looking at how justice will be done to a person to to his either the dead birth, dead father or dead mother or somebody who has been killed by a person or who has been uh, unlawfully dealt dealt by and a third party so there now in terms of the provisions of the victim and witness protection lot of rights have been conferred have been recognized by the victims and witness protection act also so when a decision is made by the president when a decision is made by the president to give offer a pardon give a pardon to the person who has been tried by a trial judge whose appeal has been heard by the court of appeal and thereafter the second appeal has been heard by the supreme court as mr ali said it's a very sacrosanct act it's a it's a matter that has to be considered with a lot of sanctity this is a power that has been given in article 34 of the constitution to the president by the people so a segment of this people is the aggrieved party a segment of this these people is the is the witnesses it is another segment of that people that do the investigation and also of and also another segment that does the prosecution and pass the judgment so this power prerogative that has been conferred on the president has to be exercised absolutely carefully it can't be on the whims and fancies of the president because power given to the president or that his office must not be taken as power given to the person say for instance power given to his excellency the form form late his excellency jr jawadana should not be exercised or should not be understood as power given to jr jawadana because now if you look at article 34 we are mostly since we are mostly speaking of presidential pardons given in death sentence cases there is a distinction between the manner in which the president is expected to exercise the power in regard to presidential pardons in regard to death sentence cases to the manner in which the president should exercise presidential power given to other matters stipulated in article sub article 2 of article 34 because there is a proviso in in regard to death sentence cases death sentence cases when the president exercises his prerogative right to grant a pardon to a person the there is a proviso which lays down the procedure 
lays down the procedure that he has to adhere to. It says, when the president exercises his right, prerogative right to confer a presidential, give a presidential pardon to a person who has been convicted, who has been sentenced to death, who has been condemned to suffer death, the president shall, they use, constitution uses the word shall, cause a report to be made to him by the judge who tried the case. That is from the trial judge. He shall call a report from the trial judge. Now, if it's a trial at bar, from the judges who tried the case, if it is Duminda Silva's case, from the three judges who tried the case from the trial at bar, there has to be a report. If it is Kuvanavala Sunil's case, from the learned judge who tried the case, you have to call for a report which was uh, those days, I think, was called the murder report. Then also, the president, I, I, I firmly believe that president has no discretion. It is not directory. It is mandatory that he shall call, cause a report to be produced to him. And when that report comes, he shall forward it to the attorney general for advice. It is stated he shall forward it, that report to the attorney. So the trial judge who has seen the evidence, well, some of us who were prosecuted in jury trials know when a jury trial takes place, the presiding, the, the trial judge makes notes, his personal notes, and if the the case ends up in a death sentence, passing of a death sentence. He compiles his notes and keeps it with himself. That is to prepare his own observations about witnesses and the case and his own view about the matter, whether death sentence should be, sentence should be carried out or not. So he has his own decision because the jury convicts him. Judge cannot be a judge of the facts in a jury trial. So he prepares his own view and opinion about the case. So he shall be, uh, he shall, they will consult the judge, trial judge, in the form of a report. He shall be consulted. So that come, has to come to the president. Then that report has to be sent to the attorney general. When that attorney general's advice is sought by the president, they are also, the president does not have a discretion. It is the word that has been used, is shall, and since it has been used as shall in the constitution, it cannot have any other meaning, but only what the word shall would mean. So it is mandatory that Attorney General is consulted by the President regarding his advice, opinion about whether or not a pardon should be given to a condemned criminal. So then you get the judge's advice, report, then you get the Attorney General's advice and both these advices should be sent to the minister in charge of the subject of justice at that time. So the justice minister also has a role to play in terms of the constitution. Because the justice minister will consider all that and put forward this recommendation. Put forward this recommendation. So there are three people who are consulted, the attorney general, the, the trial judge, the attorney general, and the justice minister. Now the question is, in, in Shamanta Jayama's case, whether the president followed that procedure laid down by the 
proviso to article and uh, article 34 1 if not there is a procedural irregularity in the granting of the uh, pardon mr chandra jayawardhan we will deal with what flows from that if there is a uh, failure to follow the procedure set out in the constitution what flows from that will be done by mr chandra jayawardhan so what i try to emphasize is it is, it is because that granting of a presidential pardon to a death sentence person who have been sentenced to death is considered so sacrosanct that this provision the, the proviso was included in such specific terms in the constitution now presidential pardons being granted is not a thing that happens only in sri lanka in england in neighboring india and various other countries there is pardon granted by the prerogative but in all these jurisdictions it has to be done it, there is a requirement for it to be done reasonably and judiciously because this is a power that has been conferred on the president to check the judiciary judiciary convicts the person conviction is upheld in appeal he is condemned to death nevertheless the executive gets the president gets the power to check the propriety of the order of the judiciary but therefore since he is considering the propriety of the order of the judiciary it has to be done with that most care that is why the procedure has been laid down now if there is a failure on the part of the president what happens next now in the 78 constitution as it was passed the the president had immunity from law suit in article 35 but with the 19th amendment coming in that was waived so i would barely say since is mr jayawardena's area that if the procedure has not been followed president himself will be subject to judicial review president himself will should be subject to judicial review now the important question that comes to i mean questions that we as practitioners have been posed with by our clients is as mr prasanthalal dial this point right he said some people come and ask in very bad cases sir after the conviction can we get a presidential part we cannot say no because there are instances where people who have been convicted of condemned for death have been given presidential part now the next question is sir how do we qualify to get the presidential part and how can how fast can we get it done so they, that is a gray area which we cannot answer for the simple reason now how the president picks a particular person to be given a part now there are so many hundreds of people in the death row i believe it was so when shamant jayama was given the presidential pardon and i believe it was also the same when which uh, dubinda silla was given presidential pardon so how did the president pick 
ask a particular person to be given a pardon. That speaking of the person or exercising the presidential pardon has to follow, go through the procedure and selecting the people for the presidential pardon also has to demonstrate that, that there is some fairness. You can pick and choose people. The selection of people to be considered for presidential pardon also has to be done very carefully because everybody who has been con condemned for death within the death row must be wanting to come out in the form by in the form of a presidential party. So how is that selection done? That is also a matter now. If it is when it is reviewed, those are matters that will be that will be uh, open for discussion in a court. How how was it selected? How were they selected? Whether the procedure was followed? All that will be matters that will be have to be answered in a court of law in justifying the granting of a presidential pardon. I I believe uh, Pulasti the Article thirty four the question that was raised is answered adequately. Yes, Th thank thank you very much, sir. Uh, if with your permission, can I uh, now uh, turn to Mr. Jawad? Yes. Mr. Javadar, are you with us? I think you are on mute, Mr. Javadar. Okay. Yes, now we can hear you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Plasti. Yes, uh, Mr. Javadar, I think um, you are a prominent member, uh, practitioner in the uh, superior courts, um, especially in the area of uh, constitutional law, fundamental rights. So what I would like to... Um, Post to you is now the I think our other panelists spoke about uh, the issue the, the 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 considerations that are applicable in the granting of a part and if you can uh, explain to our participants is the president's um, power uh, especially in view of the uh, developments that have taken place consequent to the enactment of the nineteenth amendment of the constitution as well as the uh, the decision of the Supreme Court in the case of uh, Sambandhan was the Attorney General, which where I believe the Supreme Court has sort of delineated the <clears throat> manner in which His Excellency the President could exercise his discretion uh, in the in the context of the 19th Amendment Constitution. Uh, can you explain to us how the President could exercise his rights in, uh, in granting pardons? Is it an unfettered right or will, will there be certain fetters applicable? And also, um, if, if you can briefly, whilst commenting on that, comment on how certain comparative jurisdictions like the United States or India or any other jurisdiction, uh, where the heads of state exercise um, this power. Uh, if you can elaborate on those matters, which I would be grateful. Uh, thank you very much, Pulasti. Uh, I would like to first... Uh share my thoughts on the head, uh, the power of the head of the state to grant pardons for convicted criminals. And then I will briefly touch on the, uh, uh, on Article 34 of the Constitution. Uh, so, uh, so I will deal very briefly on Article 34 and also provision in the, then I will also deal with the provision in the Victims uh, Protection Act of 2015, which is very relevant in this context. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to try to <clears throat> answer the question raised by Bulasti in the process of uh, sharing my thoughts on those areas. <clears throat> As Bulasti said at the beginning itself, the uh, the concept of granting pardon to to a criminal convicted criminal is a monarchical concept. It it can be traced its origins can be traced to to a monarchical governance. Uh, not only not only in in English law, even in Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, the pardon was by the king or the queen, uh, king or the queen, and as and, and in, in 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 maybe in in almost all the 
monarchs, monarchical go governments we had in the past. And uh, why the monarchs had that power is easy to understand because in a monarchical uh, government or a state, the king or the queen, the monarch is considered as the source of the power. So whoever who is exercising powers, the uh, all courts uh, or the judicial officers, though had different names uh, depending on the on the on the country or the or the or the, the state we are speaking of speaking of. For instance, our judicial officers were uh, maybe Disaves, uh, Gamsabhavas, all those courts or the or the or the or the adjudication uh, forums derived their powers from the king the queen who was sovereign so it is natural and inevitable that the king also had the power to grant pardons in in an appropriate case so the issue now is is whether whether under a republican constitution like ours and and uh, like in more, most of the countries in the world, whether this power of the head of the state to grant pardon for a convicted criminal after a judicial process is justifiable. Uh, so as 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 and one one and also it is also as Pulasti said in England it was referred in this law it was in the early early constitutional law books it's referred as the but the prerogative of mercy, because it was, it was a prerogative exercise of power to granting pardons, like, like a prerogative reads in administrative law. The granting mercy was also a part of the part of the prerogative discussion. Then uh, the issue, as I said, is whether in a republican constitution, that is whether that has any constitutional foundation or con constitutional justification for the president or the head of the state to have that power. <clears throat> because now, like in ours, the constitution is far, the Republican constitutions are based on the principle that uh, the people, the sovereignty is in the people, and that judicial power is also of the people and is exercised by the by the by the judicial officers. It's not a it's not a it's not a monarch's judicial power, it's the people's judicial power. Theoretically, it's the, pe it's the people's judicial power flows from the people, but practically the judicial power flows from the constitution. Like ours, Article 4 says judicial power is of the people, and then Article 3 says sovereignty is in the people, and then Article 4 is the is, is the description or the or the or the elaboration as to how the people's sovereignty is exercised. So judicial power is, is one such manifestation. So it's the people's judicial power that flows from the constitution. It's not, it's not the president's judicial power. It's not the monarch's judicial power. It's the people's judicial power. And also it is equally important uh, to note that uh, punishment of a criminal also which is, which is a punishment of a criminal sentencing to death or imprisonment is also an expression of the sovereignty of the people because judicial power flows from the people and the constitution practically. <clears throat> so whether looking at the issue, whether it's constitutional for the head of the state to have that power to override the judiciary and grant judicial power needs careful examination. And also, as Pulasi said, and, and, and also Mr. Indesi said, uh, most of the other jurisdictions uh, under, under the constitution, constitution, the head of the state, heads of the state, have been granted that power. India has that Indian constitution confers that power. The French constitution confers that power. US constitution confers that power. Then the British was unwritten, but the, the that power is exercised on behalf of the queen by by a secretary so why is that power given to the head of the state even in a republican written constitutions <clears throat> if you if you trace the constitutional theory of this is that one of the key underlying concepts of a republican constitution or, or modern constitutionalism is proportionality 
for any state action, whether it's judicial or, or, or administrative or executive, to become constitutional, it has to pass the test of proportionality. <clears throat> that's that's one of the key constitutional principles. Our constitution, we can say Article Article Twelve, which guarantees equality, imbibes that concept of concept of uh, proportionality, and also Article Eleven, which prohibits inhuman and degrading treatment, because we don't have the, uh, the right to life recognized in the constitution. But Article Eleven and Article Twelve, I think imbibes the concept of proportionality into the constitution. And it is very important that we cite, uh, I've seen the judgment of, uh, or the determination of Justice uh, Pierre Atnaik on minimum mandatory sentence is cited often. And if you look at the constitutional foundation of the judgment, although it's, it, 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 it only says it's, it's, it's uh, minimum mandatory sentence, is uh, is against Article 11, 12, 1, and and Article 4. But it actually the constitutional foundation, I think, is the is the concept of proportionality, because the law cannot by by statute or by constitution cannot deny the deny the existence or the or, 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 or occurrence of an exceptional case. So for if, for instance, if I if use that example, minimum sentence of 20 years prevents a judge from, from invoking compassion or mercy in an appropriate case. Though it's not expressly stated in the judgment, I think the rationale, if you read the judgment carefully, the rationale is that you, the legislature by constitution or by, by, by statute cannot take that the discussion of a judge to uh, exercise mercy and mercy or compassion, comp uh, compassion or mercy in an appropriate exceptional case. So that is why the judgment clearly says that my minimum mandatory sentence is inconsistent with articles 12, 1, 11, and 4, 4, which confers judicial power. So I think the same theory applies when giving the president that power to grant pardon, because there can be an exceptional, exceptional case where the criminal uh, 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 adjudication power, the criminal, criminal justice system has failed to, 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 to ensure the application of the principle of proportionality. There can be except, very exceptional case. I'm not saying can happen uh, maybe, maybe <clears throat> once in 20 years. So that power has to be there, I think, to ensure that. So to ensure the, the uh, ensure the uh, ensure that an exceptional case is covered, the power is given to the president. Then, if you look at the uh, the manner in which that, and also we all know that uh, sometimes some of the crimes are, are, are human tragedies. Some some due to social inequalities. So there can be a case where you may need the head of the state to intervene uh, to, 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 to ensure justice. Of course, uh, you know, judges exercise compassion and mercy, like, like uh, in, 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 in those uh, minimum mandatory sentence cases where parties have been uh, married subsequently or having children. So, like in those cases, there can be a case where may be necessary for the president to have that power. So I think there is a constitutional justification for the president to have that power to be exercised in, an, uh, in a very exceptional situation. And that is what he, the justification behind inclusion of this power or the conferring of this power to a president or the head of, head of the state in a, in a, repub in a republic. <clears throat> then the issue with our constitution was, in 90, uh, as enacted in 1978, was that the president was immune totally from, uh, from, from legal proceedings. There was the, the judgment said the president cannot be questioned even by way of a 
fundamentals of application or 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 it application let alone of the there have been a, a different interpretation of the meaning of civil and criminal proceedings but the law was that as interpreted by the supreme court was that the president cannot be brought to court so the president was given that power to bypass the judiciary and which which again is not subject to judicial review but with the 19th amendment the, the supreme court was given the power to review a decision of the president in in the exercise of fundamental rights jurisdiction so if the president's exercise of that power is uh, is i use the word uh, illegal or, or obnoxious to article 121 the supreme court can intervene so now the supreme court has the power to check on the president then also it is very important by the 2015 act of uh, of the uh, assistance to and protection of victims of crime and witnesses act for 2015 which recognizes rights of rights of uh, for victim of crime including the to be treated uh, uh, i'm 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 uh, if i may refer to article 3 section 3 of of that act section 3 says a victim of crime shall have the right a to be treated with equality fairness and with respect to the dignity of, of uh, dignity and privacy of such victim then b where the victim is a child victim to, to be treated in a manner which ensures the best interest of such child in accordance then uh, then very importantly which was which was with this uh, which was enacted this act was enacted after the 19th and subsequent to the 19th amendment 3 months later or uh, two months later rather section 3 q expressly says that if if the head of the if the authority is is considering the grant of pardon to a to a to an offender then the victim is entitled to have notice and and uh, to state the manner in which the offense committed had impacted on his life including his body state of mind employment profession occupation income and quality of life property and any other aspects concerning his life <clears throat> so if 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 somebody's mother is is killed in a crime the child is entitled to, is now statutorily entitled to be heard a form of hearing in writing in writing in that you entitled to have received notice of the consideration by the head of the state So the week now we know during the last maybe thirty forty years the, the, the maybe twenty years the focus of the criminal law also has slightly shifted towards the victim's rights as well. So the victim now has that right. So the vic- so in the process of uh, the president considering uh, the exercising the powers under Article thirty four, it is it is it is mandatory that the victim is given notice. and is or her position is as a thing as to as to as to as to the impact of the crime on him physically and 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 social and 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 even even assuming the, that the victim protection act was not there still i think the victim is entitled to be heard uh under the, uh, the uh, in the name of natural justice before a consideration of 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 granting pardon to a convicted criminal so now of course the statutory scheme is 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 also there giving that right then the constitutional procedure as as uh, elaborated by mr in the this uh first the president has to call for a report from the judge who heard the heard the case then it has to be sent to the attorney general for for his advice then the then the then the matter goes before the Minister of Justice, Minister in charge of the subject of justice, with Attorney General's advice, then the minister has to make a recommendation. Then the statutory requirement under the Victims Protection Act for the for the for the 
for the possession of the victim to be ascertained. So, if only those uh, procedural steps are satisfied, that the procedure that that can say that the procedure has been followed, even assuming there was no uh, victim protection act, I still think if the victim is not hurt, then it is still procedurally so. Then, I am I I think not only. Uh, it must satisfy the statutory and constitutional procedure. It must also satisfy the the, the test of proportionality, uh, given the given the nature of the crime, impact on the on 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 the life on the life of the of the victim, and an impact on the society, disturbance to the society, uh, and the public public perception. All those matters, whether those the only if those matters are satisfied. Can say that the test of proportionality has been has been uh, satisfied. So not only on procedural irregularity, I think the president's decision of granting pardon under Article Thirty Four should pass the ordinary test of judicial review. Uh, if it is, of course, under Article Twelve One, still principles of proportionality, rationality, and procedural uh, procedural. Propriety, natural justice, all will come. So, not only on procedural grounds, I think on the on the ground of proportionality in particular, a procedure can be challenged, and 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 uh, of course we'll have to wait and see whether 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 what the in the independent cases what the what the decision would be. And uh, I think it's a sta standard judicial review test will apply. And now, under the after the nineteenth amendment, since the judiciary is is given that power, the Supreme Court is given that power to check the president's powers. I think the president having that power is I don't think it's unconstitutional or unjustifiable. It's the president may have uh, can have that power, and I would say should have that power exercised in a in a very very exceptional case where. The police department at the investigation level, the OIC, the investigators, the attorney general at the indictment level, the, uh, the the trial judge at the high court to magistrate court level, then the appellate uh, appellate court hearing the criminal matter, the high court or the or the court of appeal, and then the supreme court. If, if all those forums, the the judges have failed or missed the the missed. Uh, Reason to reason to uh, uh, we miss the miss the or has failed to uh, impose a proportionate sentence, then president may intervene. But subject to again subject to review of the Supreme Court under Article uh, one hundred and twenty six, and 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 another provision that is that comes in with the power with the president's power is Article. Uh, the proviso to Article 89D of the Constitution. <coughs> uh, Article 89D of the Constitution. If a person gets convicted of an offense punishable for more than for a cent, uh, for a term of say, uh, uh, for a term not less than. Uh, for a pun for an offence punishable uh, with imprisonment for a term not less than years, if he is a member of parliament, he loses that seat. That, like what happened to uh, uh, Sir Ranjan Ramanayaka, where he was found uh, guilty of con uh, contempt of court and sentenced, because there was an argument that there was no minimum mandatory sentence imposed by the constitution or a law, but still. <clears throat> uh, because there was different different reason given by the court of appeal. I believe this is a, is a very valid reasoning. He loses seat. Member of parliament loses his seat, and then the proviso says, right, that if any person disqualified under the law is granted a, a free pardon, such disqualification ceases from the date on which the pardon is granted. <clears throat> so I think this proviso is. Is is granting pardon is 
is justifiable on, on, on the constitutional principle of proportionality. But I think granting of pardon resulting in, 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 in erasing the disqualification under Article 89D and, and, and disqualification under respective provisions in the Provincial Council Selection Act, the Local Authority Selections Act. So I think it's is time to rethink and, and take out of the statute book. So in conclusion, what I think is, uh, as Mr. Prasantalal Dialis Presidents Council said, of course, we have to take into account the deterrent as a deter that the punishment has to be deterrent. But law should not deny an exceptional situation as well, like it, ha like it happened in, in those man minimum mandatory sentence cases. <clears throat> so those are my views on these issues. I, uh, I hope I've uh, covered the question posed to me by Kulas. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jayawadhan. I think uh, it, was a, uh, it was a very enlightening uh, and informative uh, discussion by all three of our panelists. I have received several questions uh, from the chat box as well as uh, several people have messaged me on Facebook uh, posing numerous questions, but I think uh, we are we are almost, uh, the time is almost up, so I, I, I think ma maximum we can only answer about one or two questions. Um, several questions have been posed uh, regarding um, contempt of court cases. Um, so just to just to rephrase the, the the gist of the questions posed in this context, I leave it open to all the panelists. Uh, if all of you can briefly answer, uh, when it comes con contempt of court cases, uh, I think the, the, the participants seem to uh, think that uh, since um, a person who is uh, convicted of contempt of court has acted in uh, in contempt of or in a manner that disrupts or disturbs or uh, traverses the sanctity of the justice system as a whole. Is it? What are your thoughts on whether a person guilty of contempt of court should should the president have a power independent or overriding that of the uh, the judicial power exercised by the judiciary? to grant pardon for such a person who has acted in contempt of the justice system per se. If uh, if any of you can briefly express your thoughts on that, uh, sir, sir, I would be grateful. Plus the, uh, it, to have the independence of the judiciary, the respect of the judiciary must be maintained. No? So no one can be allowed to have contempt of court in the first place. There is contempt of court. If there is a humiliation of the court, there is no respect because we have to understand judges can't respond. No. Now politicians can go have a press conference. Judges can't have press conferences. So we, it is the bar association and we all have to protect the independence of the judiciary. Otherwise, Montexu, this concept won't work. So anyone who is contempt of court and found guilty, I respectfully feel no one should be allowed to go unpunished. But in a case where, sadly, we have chief justices who openly say that they release people who, are, who should have been convicted. So we are in a huge dilemma in the present state. There was a chief justice like that. And there was the president and the prime minister staying in parliament. Another chief justice saying that I will continue to uh, give judgments in favor of you. That was said in the parliament. So in that kind of a context, we are in a dilemma. But as a policy, because of independence, and because we will protect the judiciary, we cannot allow contempt of court at any cost. That's my view. Uh, so you can't give presidential pardon for those if he's found guilty by the highest court. Because there is an appeal, no? There's a law, a court of appeal, and there is an appeal to the Supreme Court. So, uh, so in that kind of a context, uh, I, I would not agree for presidential pardon for contempt of court on the basis of context shows uh, separation of powers and the independence of the judiciary. Mr. Indati Sam, Mr. Jawad, uh, yes, Mr. Jawad, I think you want to respond. So, uh, uh, to that. Yes, yes, go, go ahead. Yes. In case of a contempt of court of the Supreme Court, as the Supreme Court con convicts, then there is no right of appeal. So, so there is a, there is a, yes, so then that is a, whether 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 the president should exercise that power or not, I don't think it should depend on the offense because the, the constitution also doesn't 
refer to a particular category of offense. Of course, in case of death, there is a stringent. Uh, 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 and in case of an offense punishable with death, death. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, I don't think simply because it's contempt, president should not be allowed to do that. But in an appropriate case, if the if 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 the punishment, the president thinks punishment is 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 not proper, it's not proportionate. President can exercise that power, of course, in an in an exceptional situation. Subject to again review by the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court will again see if the president, let's assume president, uh, president uh, pardons uh, uh, convict of uh, contempt of court, then again matter can be brought before the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court will have to see whether, whether, whether again whether the the punishment is proportionate. So I think it should not depend on the offence. I think it should depend more on 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 other the procedure procedure and 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 the case of proportion. Mr. Indadis, sir, any would you like to add? I I I also uh, feel uh, merely because it is contempt of court, uh, the the constitutional right that is available in respect of other offences should not be given to uh, people convicted of contempt of court uh, might not be uh, something uh, something uh, that i can wholeheartedly agree on of course while while agreeing that contempt of court has to be dealt with to act as a deterrent against people who are committing contempt of Court, uh, the same as Mr. Jayavadan said, the same procedure that has to be followed in the case of uh, in the case of uh, giving pardon to other offense in other offenses, where you you uh, very cautiously give, evaluate the evidence. Listen to the parties concerned. Of course, of course, there is the problem where, unlike in other cases, where the victim is there, the victim here is the court. So the court cannot be heard. There won't be a representation from court, uh, and um, you know, disagreeing with the pardon being given, or agreeing, or expressing their view with regard to the. Uh, whether whether the pardon should be given or not. Uh, apart, uh, apart from that distinction in respect of contempt of court matters, uh, as Mr. Jayavadan uh, rightly said, there is only if, if in the case of a Supreme Court convicting a person for contempt, where yeah, there are no right of appeal. It is unsafe to leave it that way. Sometimes, and if the president thinks it is an ab appropriate case, and if the president acts kind of judiciously in evaluating the evidence, getting reports from various uh, institutions involved, and analyzes that and gives considers his, the matter before him. I think uh, merely because it is contempt of court, we must not deprive the constitutional safeguard, uh, my constitutional right to get a pardon. Uh, I agree with Mr. Jayavadana's view uh, in that context. Thank, uh, thank you, sir. I believe we can. Uh, we we have already exceeded our allocated time uh, uh, because I think uh, we have exceeded our allocated time by a few minutes. I um, yeah. apologize for any part to any participants who had uh, sent us questions but could not uh, we could not uh, take your questions because I think uh, already we are over time. Uh, so, uh, so in that uh, setting uh, may I be permitted to uh, wrap up this discussion uh, uh, I thank uh, all of our panelists, Mr. Prashantalal, the Alice President's Council, uh, Mr. Nalinda Indithis, uh, <coughs> President's Council, Mr. Shant uh, I think we've had a very enlightening and interesting.
discussion uh, about the issue uh, uh, full of anecdotes have been aware of some of these matters, especially with regard to jury, jury trials and uh, other things that were discussed. Uh, so um, I think uh, we had a very interesting and engaging discussion on this issue. I thank everyone who have joined us on Zoom as well as uh, the numerous uh, uh, participants who have joined us via the BASL YouTube channel. And I should also thank the, the seminars committee of the BASL uh, headed by Mr. Isuru Balabatabandi and the technical team, uh, Nikini, Mapiti Gama and Adisha uh, for helping us uh, with the webinar today. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, sirs. And thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, Join with the BSL soon on the next uh, webinar uh, and see you all. Have a good day. Good night. Thank you, everyone.